Welcome from the Australian, Australian Fabian's Victorian branch to everybody and to our speaker, Matt Coote, on the subject of Poland, a crisis for equality and social democracy. Um, I'm Sarah Howe. I'm, um, uh, of, uh, I'm on, a member of the Fabian's executive and I'll be your moderator for this evening's discussion. Uh, I'd firstly like to begin proceedings with uh, a welcome to country. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Fabian Society acknowledges uh, the traditional owners, custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We also pay our respects to elders, their elders past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So in terms of the uh, meeting structure tonight, uh, the structure is going to be that we have our um, speaker on, who's Matt, obviously, um, for roughly half an hour, taking us through to 8 p.m. At 8 p.m., we're going to move to an online question and answer session and a chat. Uh, just to let you know, we will be taking questions uh, to our speaker via the Zoom chat function on the side there. If you've got that Zoom group chat, you can open that up. Uh, you can submit chats at any time and we'll attempt to pick out questioners who reflect the main themes that emerge. The chat will also be visible only to the event team during the presentation. Uh, at around 8.45pm, um, we're going to wrap up the discussion. And after the formal meeting, everybody is invited to uh, grab a drink and some nibbles and join us on an online pub session. Um, we do this because we're trying to maintain the social aspect of our face-to-face -face events, which are usually traditionally followed by dinner and drinks at, at an actual pub. But given that we're all in lockdown, uh, we're doing an online event to post the, this event. Uh, we encourage all members at that time to switch on, to, on the video to improve sociability um, of the whole thing. So it's now, um, <clears throat> that's the sort of housekeeping. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, who is a former European Studies colleague of mine from RMIT University. Matthew Coote is a research officer at the EU Centre of Excellence uh, in the School of Global and Social Studies at RMIT. He's assisting with projects on regional policy and smart specialisation sustainable development goals, innovation and trade, and also researching contemporary election results in Eastern and Northern Europe, and uh, looking at their implications for social democracy. Matthew has al also been a long-standing member of the uh, Fabian's executive um, between 2015 and 19. <clears throat> so tonight, his speech is gonna concentrate on the political implications of the recent re-election of Andre Duda, Conservative President of Poland. He won a second term in July 2020. Uh, Duda's victory followed the re-election of the Law and Justice Party, the 2019 parliamentary election. And since coming to power, the Law and Justice Party has sought to make, remake Polish society in accord with its own blend of nationalist, social, conservative and populist ideology. And it strengthened its control over crucial institutions such as the media and the judiciary actively promoting anti-immigrant and homophobic rhetoric while at the same time boosting welfare support to those as seen as fitting into its socially conservative vision. I'm reading off Matthew's um, uh, <clears throat> speech um, summary here. So the speaker is now going to focus on quest the questions that arise from those political developments that include uh, why are social democrats in Poland fa failing to present a coherent platform that resonates with voters at large and with the progressive movement? What can social democrats in Australia and elsewhere learn from what is happening in Poland and the situation of Poland should be cons of concern to social democrats all over the world, including Australia? So what are the implications for equality in that nation be and beyond? So without um, further ado, uh, I will now hand over to Matthew Coote to speak. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm just going to share the screen now. Let's just see if this works. No. 
We can see that. Oh, no. mm. You can see that. Poland a crisis. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Hopefully it's the hopefully it's the right one. If not, we'll just have to impro improvise. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Sarah. And I noticed just before I start, Sarah, what's that in the background? Do I see on the back wall there? <laughs> Some That's, of our um, members of the. My father is actually Brian Howe, is a politician, but he was a left wing activist in his day, and he actually acquired that in Poland during the, um, after the the great strike. So it's the. Yeah. Yes. The fantastic. Last. So that's yeah, actually an original um, poster. Yeah, and, and, and very event. relevant for what we're going to talk yeah. about today. Thank, mm. That's great. Okay, and uh, thank you for the, all, the, all the Fabians for joining, joining tonight. Um, ALP members, uh, Social Democrats, members of the Australian community, members of the Australian Polish community, and, and all others as well. Just going to, can you see my second screen now, the, the map? Does that come up? Yep. Beautiful, so we're away. Okay, so... so uh, Poland, a crisis for equality and social democracy. I'm just going to do some quick background uh, information on Poland. So just to, so I can get this little pen to work. Beautiful. So there is just a reminder of what we're talking about. There is Poland in Eastern, Eastern Europe, a relatively large country. There's, um, this is the uh, European Union, or, although it's got the United Kingdom in there. This map's a, a year old. Um, you might notice that Poland is on the eastern border of the of the EU. It's been a member of the EU since 2004. Note Bel Belarus or Belarus, uh, presence of Russia, the Ukraine there in the east. Um, there's about one to two million. Pre-COVID, there was one to two million um, Ukrainian citizens that were working was working in Poland, um, and that's obviously the former Soviet Union there, and then. On the western side, we have Germany, and Poland and Germany have um, very, very strong links and uh, historical links as well. So, just a reminder about Poland. So, 38 million people. It's the sixth largest in the EU. Um, a very much a homogenous, um, homogenistic um, society in the sense it's about 94 to 97 percent um, Polish, depending on on the on the measure. Uh, measure used. As I said, there's there's um, people from other countries working in Poland as well, for example, the Ukrainians. Um, a very large percentage of Poles identify as Roman Catholic, which is um, very unusual in European terms these days, or, although they are in the in the East. Um, GDP is is about 22nd in the world, once again, depending on the, on the measure, 6th or 7th in the EU. So Poland is considered in the in the literature um, as a a middle power. So many Australians will be familiar with that term. That's often a term used to describe Australia. I do note that I have not come across um, anywhere yet that Poland is punching above its weight, uh, which is often re uh, used to refer to Australia. Um, very influential in in Central and Eastern Eastern Europe um, as a former um, communist state and relatively large in, in population terms. Warsaw is the financial and economic hub of Poland. Warsaw is doing quite well uh, economically. People are doing quite well. Um, just a reminder, though, that um, like Sydney is not Australia, Warsaw is not. Poland. It's part of Poland, but not all of Poland. And as I mentioned, um, Poland has been a member of the EU since 2004, and it has benefited from EU membership in, in many ways, um, especially when it comes to receiving um, a considerable amount of funds, because Poland being um, located in the east and considered less developed than Western Europe, um, has um, because of the the growth funds, the, the funds are distributed around the EU. The EU has put a lot of money in, or EU member states have put a lot of money in to to Poland um, to promote social programs and infrastructure and the like. Just a quick note on um, Poland Australian relations. I note uh, I did have a look and see that there were some people here tonight um, who I recognise from the Polish community. Um, in Australia, which obviously Australia is a very much a multicultural society, and so we have lots of people from all over the world, and um, 
Poland is no exception. There's approximately 180,000 people in Australia who have Polish heritage. And I must say that um, um, Poles have made an immense, immense, immense contribution to Australian society over the years for a long, long period of time as well. Um, in, in, the, in the fields of uh, the, the arts, in the fields of science and education and sport and even politics, as you can see, see there with uh, my picture there as well, where the Queensland Premier, Australia's third largest state, has Polish heritage. Uh, Magna Chubansky, she's also, I've put her up there, actor. Um, I'll refer to her um, throughout the presentation. Also, also should note the immense impact that the um, Polish Jewish community has made to Australian society as well. Once again, leaders in, in many, many fields. In fact, um, um, the first Governor General of Australia, the first, no, correction, the first Australian-born Governor General of Australia, Sir Isaac Isaacs, was of Polish Jewish heritage. Now, I just, uh, while we're on the, uh, well, I've got some images up, I'll put some images up of um, some key players in, in the Polish political scene. Um, as, as mentioned in the introduction, up on the left-hand side there is President Duda, um, and that was his, his uh, competitor at the last election, form, the former um, Mayor of Warsaw. We've also need, we should also note um, Yaroslav Kaczynski, the um, leader of the Law and Justice Party. Now, he is the guy at the front here. He is um, an important figure because, a former Prime Minister as well, um, but he is not Prime Minister at the moment. The chap behind him is Prime Minister of, of Poland, but um, Kaczynski is very influential in that party and is, is considered to be the person pulling, pulling the strings. Um, down here, we've got uh, Donald Tusk. Um, I, I, I suspect that many people now recognise Donald Tusk. You may not have recognised him um, five, five years ago. He uh, is former Prime Minister of Poland, but very, very much influential in, he was very much influential in the European Union as President of the European Council and came to prominence around 2015 with the refugee crisis in Europe. And also he was heavily involved in the uh, EU-British uh, negotiations around Brexit. Uh, Berta uh, Szydlow is a former um, uh, Prime Minister of Poland. Um, Polish politics is very much dominated by, by men, but there have been women in, the, in positions of power. Uh, she was in uh, Prime Minister for when Lauren Justice won the election in 2015. She was Prime Minister. But this chap up here, um, well, officially, officially she stood down because she was too critical of the EU, but the, the word on the, the street is, well, I can tell you what happened. He, he said, it's time for you to go. Um, so just now I'm going to touch briefly on Polish history because this is important to understand contemporary Poland, but also to understand the political scene in Poland, but, and also I think to understand why social democrats are not doing as well as one may uh, expect so i'll just um touch on it briefly um poland has a long tradition of um uh, obviously it's geopolitically very very important uh, where it's located as i showed you on on the map um so it's a very important geopolitical position between you know, major powers france and and russia and prussia in in the past um Polish history is also very much marked by uprisings, wars, um, you know, defending its freedom and sovereignty from foreign aggressions. Um, at one stage, it was the largest country in Europe. Uh, then it was um, uh, with partitions, a series of partitions. It was basic. It was wiped off the map for 123 years. Um, there's a strong feelings in Poland still today obviously amongst the older community, but still today, because history, uh, they, they learn their history in, in Poland, um, of betrayal by Western powers, betrayal by Russia. Um, that, as I said, that sense of invasion, the, the idea of, of uh, standing up for the country and her heroic de defeats, 
Um, but also there's that, that strong sense of um, anti-communism mm. as well, um, because Poland was um, um, for many decades a, a part of the Eastern Bloc. It, through those, many people consider those dark times and through those times, um, what, what one important um, keystone was the election of the Polish Pope, um, Pope John Paul, the first uh, non-Italian Pope for, I think it was for a couple of hundred, hundred years. A um, couple of people may have heard me say this before. Um, I'm very surprised even today when I talk to people who may be you know, centre-right liberals or centre-left liberals who from Poland, and they, but they are still, um, you know, that sense of pride around, around the, around the um, Polish Pope even though he's, he was very much a socially conservative Pope, but a strong supporter of um, democracy uh, and, were, and did a lot of work behind the scenes, you know, the idea around dialogue and reformism behind the scenes when it came to the, uh, the introduction of democracy in that part of the world. And that links in with um, the Solidarity Trade Union Movement, I, the banner that Sarah's got up the back there. Um, yeah. The, for a time, the illegal trade union movement that developed in the north of the country, um, anti-communist, pro-independence democratic movement, had such an impact. In fact, when I was um, first went to uni um, a few years ago, a, couple, a little while ago, um, um, academics in international relations were still talking about the important impact that Sol solidarity had on on um, the, that part of the world, and. And uh, you don't hear you don't hear much about that um, these days, and and so Poland moved um, obviously with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, Poland um, moved into a, uh, a period of democracy, uh, opening up the country. Um, very much in the in the early years of Poland, it was very much um, you know, opening up the market, get get things going. Uh, remove regulation, uh, a lot of selling off of assets, and um, you know, opening up the financial markets, and 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 people did benefit in Poland. Some people did benefit in Poland, not not all. And there's that uneven development, and there's a sense from some people that things went too far too quickly. Okay, so here's what's happened in post-communist period. Um, so what's what, what we've got here, and I think the important thing for discussion tonight is to look at, um, at these these points here. Now, just in the in the red, that's the Social Democrats. Social Democrats, there they were, they have been in government. Um, here is the the centre right. I consider the centre right. They're the um, the liberals in the poll poll. Polish sense, and the here is the Law and Justice Party. If you just see now, just just have a look here. Um, I hope you can see my pointer there. Just so the first um, free elections were in 1991. There were some elections in 1989, but they're only um, partially partially fair. Um, the ruling um, Communist Party at the time, I think I can't remember the proportion. I think it was about 40 percent of seats were open open uh, for democratic election. And I think, and, and the Solidarity Party won all, all all the seats that were on offer, which is a real shock to the system at um, the one party um, uh, communist system at the time. Now, um, so you can just see there that, that, that transition. So there's been that transition. So it's only been you know 30 years, and you can see parties come and go. Um, see the rise of the Social Demo Democrats there, and then the fall of the Social Democrats as well. One of the important things that happened um, was that it really had an impact on on the party and their standing in in the community, and then there was that, and then there was a you know relationship uh, with with some members were you know they had some relationship with the former communist party, so they threw that together and it was like oh we can't we can't trust. Can't, can't trust this group. Now, just on the um, centre right um, civic platform uh, and Lauren and Lauren Justice Party here, which I'll talk about more in detail shortly. They both come from 
uh, threads from solidarity, the solidarity movement. So they've gone in different directions, but that's many members of the party, uh, older members of that party were members of uh, solidarity as well. So there's still that strong anti anti communist feeling. Recent elections in Poland. Okay, so what's been happening in recent times? In short, the Law and Justice Party have been um, are winning. So presidential elections, parliamentary elections, um, they even won the most seats in the um, 2019 European, European parliamentary elections for the Polish delegates. The 2015, oops, the 2015 election was um, uh, really a, a surprise because they won a majority in both chambers that had not happened in post, uh, both chambers of the Polish parliament, lower and upper house, that had not happened in post-communist um, Poland. We'll talk about why just in a moment. And, and um, then they were successful again last year. And as noted in the introduction, um, in the introduction there, have, am I, can you hear me still? Yes, we can hear you, Matt. Oh, okay, just an image here that I've frozen and a couple of other people have frozen. Your image is frozen, but we can hear you okay. So my image is frozen? Yes, but we can hear you fine. Okay, and bet you can still see my, my slideshow? Yes. yes. Beautiful. Okay, we'll push on. Okay, and so um, in 2020, the, the um, 2020, as mentioned, um, President Duda was re-elected as well. Should note that he's officially an independent. Um, he was a member of the Law and Justice Party, but he, once he was elected in 2015 as president, he, he, reneged, he uh, handed in his membership. So let's move to the next one. Okay, just going back to 2019, the, the election, this is where it's important because the the uh, government, is, government is formed in the lower house of the Polish par parliament and you need 231 for a majority. The Law and Justice Party, as mentioned, was successful. Um, a very high percentage of votes in Polish terms in post-communist Poland. The Civic Coalition, Civic Platform, um, they uh, have been the main opposition party in recent times. Um, a lot, of, a lot of folks here tonight are interested in social democrats and social democracy. You see that the, they, they, they are, um, they're running under the banner of the left. It was a coalition, social democrats and some other left-wing parties that ran together. The 12.5% um, 12 12 may not seem a lot, but at the 2015 election, they failed to pass the electoral threshold. And so rather than gaining... Um, 49 seats they got no seats at the last election so that's why it's a plus plus 49 so in one sense you can say they're on the way back long way to go and then you've got other other groups um as as well but they're the main ones in poland just as an aside uh how are we going for, how are we going for time just an aside um one thing you will know with um that's of interest with um, european politics is that in some countries, you get these minority parties because, you know, in order to reflect the minority populations in particular parts, and so in this case, there's a German minority party. They they're not uh, obliged to pass the threshold, so they're protected. They gain one seat. You've got about five more minutes. Okay, I better race through. So why why does all this matter? Well, okay, at the 2015 campaign, the Law and Justice Party. Um, campaigned against corruption. And so, I, uh, as I mentioned, the Social Democrats have previously gone through some corruption scandals. Well, the centre-right civic platform also had some issues around corruption. So they campaigned against corruption. We're not corrupt. And, um, and they were ultimately successful. They also targeted, if you remember the time that was at the height of the refugee and asylum seeker crisis in Europe, they also used the, the refugees and asylum seekers as targets in government very much nationalist, socially conservative, but economically populist. They're, and they have the support of the Catholic Church. So very much there's restrictions on LB, LGBT rights, um, rhetorical attacks on the community. And, and 
in uh, in some regions of Poland, particularly in the in the east and the south, um, some some regional governments have just declared their zones and areas uh, LGBT free, um, which has gained support from um, the party up above. There are also restrictions on women's rights, so um, very much restrictions on um, uh, abortion, for example, uh, and issues around um, sexual, sexual reproduction. And also there's been considerable cuts to funding around that area as well. Uh, and they have the Law and Justice Party, as, as some will know, have strengthened their control over important institutions in Poland, the public media, basically taken over the public media, and there's issues around the judiciary and legal rights, and the EU have been looking at this considerably, and there's been a bit of toing and froing. Um, it's a real concern. There's been judges, you know, you don't see judges and, and people, you know, such people marching on the streets, but they have been in Poland in recent years. Now, important to note that the Law and Justice Party have delivered on their promises, and this is interesting because we need to talk about why they've been successful. And, you know, they promised tax cuts and they delivered. They, and they promised this 500 plus program, um, which you may or may not have heard about. This is an unconditional payment to parents for, for children. Uh, many polls are supportive of this. Supportive of this. The theory, the, it, was, it was sold that we want to support Polish families, want to support people to have more children. Hasn't been as successful, hasn't been successful in, in uh, you know, the birth rate, but, but it's very popular. It's, Initially, it was for the second, third, fourth child. Now, it's been expanded to the first child. Um, it boosted the direct welfare support. They haven't put money into, you know, welfare services. It's this, this direct transfer from, from politician to, to family. Um, now, if we had been having this, if we had been having this, this um, session at the start of the year and, and you would ask and say somebody asked me about this, I would have said, I think, not sure how they're going to fund this in the long term because they're spending a lot of money on on this program and uh, and they're going to run into trouble in this pro, in this covid world where obviously we've had this serious health issue but it's also an economic issue where a lot of governments are running now into deficit spending money and doing similar things um you know support payments for families people and businesses um it's changed the dynamic, changed the dynamic a bit, um, and I've changed my my view around it. I can talk about that perhaps in the questions. Campaign 2019 and 2020 um, presidential campaigns. I'll race through now. It's so there's no refugees to attack, no asylum seekers to attack. They went after the LGBT community. Um, you know, they described the LGBT community as a threat to the nation. Ideology is like communism. They're coming in to take over. They tried to make, they made links with um, uh, pedophilia, uh, invasion, they carry disease, all sorts of terrible things. I will not quote them because it's just shocking some of the, some of the things that they said. And I do apologise apologize if it um, does offend. Um, lots of uh, clashes on the streets. Um, as I said about the LGBT free zone, that was supported by a newspaper. You know, the government now run the newspaper. Um, and then days, just days before the election, the government broadcast a, um, uh, broadcast a documentary called Invasion, and it was an anti-LGBT uh, documentary, a uh, documentary, in inverted commas. Where are the Social Democrats in this? You know, we know about the Social Democrats in there and their, um, you know, base, their, and their, the importance of Social Democrats around tackling inequality, often it tends to be around economic, but it's also social. Um, where, where are they? What are they doing at the moment in, in Poland? Um, just to, to repeat from that previous graph, this is what's been happening with the Social Democrats over, over the, over in post-communist Poland on the decline, a um, little bit of a spike here in recent election. Perhaps this mirrors what's happening um, in Western Europe. Often you hear about the decline of the Social Democrats and the focus is on uh, Western Europe because the Social Democratic parties are more established there, you know, longer, longer history. Um, that's just a, a quick graph to show you 
some of the declines in the par parties, equivalents there. And here's another example, the European Parliament, there's the there's the socialists and social democrats. The interesting thing about the European Parliament is, whilst it doesn't have as as uh, as many as much power as um, you think a parliament can have, it does have rights to amend legislation and some budgets. But um, all the all the uh, social democratic parties for uh, the political parties that the EU member states put put parties up. And they run so UK Labour when it was in there used to you know put up candidates, and uh, the Social Democrats of Germany would put up candidates, and uh, uh, equivalent here in, in Poland and in Spain, and but then all go to the European Parliament, but they'd all sit in a group of Social Democrats. Same with the Greens, and same with the Christian, um, so-called Christian Democrats. So you have these national parties putting up candidates, and they go and sit in groups, which is a really interesting way of doing it. So it's not based on, on on country. Decline of social democracy. Well, we if you read the literature, you see these explanations. You know, it's globalization, things have changed, um, a rise of technology, decline of the working class, the social democrats have been so success so successful, there's this mass affluence, um, people have risen up, up the ladder of opportunity. Yeah, another explanation is the collapse of the post-war economic boom. Um, so that means that the the social democratic parties have lost that ability to fund a lot of their programs. Um, um, another thing is, there's t another explanation is, oh, there's too much focus on identity politics, and you know you should get back to the core issues. And then it's just a fragmentation of society. Things things have changed. So uh, I'm not, it's not one or the other. These are the explanations that that are, that and is, that are often. Uh, used um, to explain the decline. Perhaps it's a bit of bit of uh, all, all of those, but we can talk about those later because I know there are people here that are interested in social democracy. What are the lessons from Poland? Um, it's a long way away from Australia. It's part of the EU. It's in Eastern Europe. What can we take from that? Well, what do you think? Um, how can how 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 can social democrats in Australia? You know, we look at social democrats in Australia. How do they? How can how can social democrats, um, i.e., the ALP, how can they connect with voters? How can it happen in how does it happen in New Zealand? What can what can be done to connect with voters? What do you think? Because I know that uh, Fabian's very much um, concerned about this issue. What the lessons of Poland? Well, you know, I'm going to say don't be corrupt, and and hopefully you're sitting there and you say, well, you know. Thank you, um, Mr. Obvious. But what I would say to that is, uh, it's you know good in theory, but it, it seems to be a bit harder on the ground because we've seen what happened in Poland. Um, as we sit here tonight, um, there are people. I'll be blunt. There are people in New South Wales, in the New South Wales Labor Party, who have either been in jail or are in in jail due to corruption. So, you know, it's a real issue. It's the wrong thing to do, but it's also, you know, a, has a real impact on, on the party and how it's seen by the, by the voters. And, you know, when you have um, a right-wing mainstream media who's just looking for this stuff and trying to set people up as well, um, it really plays into their hands. The other thing I would say is based on experience in Poland, the Law and Justice Party, I'm not saying let's repeat the policies, but um, perhaps, you know, you deliver on your promises. And we've heard of, you know, Julia Gellar, there'll be no carbon tax. Uh, Tony Abbott, there'll be no, you know, from the other side, there'll be no cuts to the health, there'll be no cuts to the ABC. Um, you know, from time and time again, we hear, prom we hear these politicians making big promises and then they fail to deliver. Um, the other thing I would say is we need to understand our history now. The importance of history, as I said, in Poland, the the right wing have been able to tap into this idea of invasion, um, which is real in Pol in Polish terms, and we need to learn as social democrats to try and understand. You know, I think we need a greater understanding of Australian history. I'm not saying that you know we should talk about invasion or anything like that, but you know there is that concept 
of Australia as an island and, you know, all that debate around asylum seekers and refugees. Um, you know, some people are concerned about, you know, so boat people, for, for example. But there are other aspects of Australian history perhaps we can learn. And um, how can social democrats make use of uh, international networks? Now, this is interesting as I just wind up. I'm just finishing up, Sarah. Um, you know, for example, uh, social, social media. Now, just a couple of examples, some examples I've got here. This is the uh, EU uh, Commissioner for, for Equality. And she, she posted up here on social media. Now, I, learned, I follow Polish politics, but I'm you know, not picking up everything all the time. This came to my, my Twitter feed. And you may be interested to note there that uh, this is something the EU can do when, in regards to um, what's happening around um, LGBT rights in Poland. And so the EU have decided that they're going to reject funding from some, uh, some of the uh, towns that are putting applications to, to link up with other towns in the EU. Uh, as I me mentioned about Magda, uh, Magda um, being, just being an actor, she's got 100,000 100, 100, plus uh, followers and she posted this on her page um, the other day and I picked this up as well. And you may notice, and I uh, had that image, those images up at the start and said that Polish politics is very much dominated by men. This is true, but there's a small group of uh, women and they, uh, uh, who have really making a stand in recent, recent times. And if you just see there that uh, in support of the LGBT community, now they went into the parliament and when the president Duda was uh, yeah, uh, for the second term, when he was being installed for the second term. So that was just the other day. And then I posted this. Just I posted about this event, and this was picked up by Julie Ward, the member for European Parliament of British. So she's on the way out. Um, um, former member for European Parliament, and she said, "Well, what's what's the concern here? Why should we be concerned with Poland?" And um, basically, she said, "We're all an international movement, and there's many many truths to that." So uh, I'll just conclude and say. Another issue, another issue we need to deal with, and I've touched on it, is um, is COVID. Perhaps we can talk about this down down the track. I'm just wondering what's going to happen with the COVID situation because we've got this. As I said, many countries now are, are running a deficit. Um, I myself was caught up. Uh, I must admit, you know, being a member of the Labor Party, there's always often a lot of tax from the other side of politics here in Australia about, you know, Labor Party can't manage money. Um, and so, you know, budget deficits, they'll never get a surplus. And so I was always concerned that the Labor Party was spending, you know, you know have a tight budget, um, try and, you know, uh, try, and, try and have a surplus. Um, now we're all in deficit uh, and it's happening around the, happening around, around the world. Perhaps things, things are changing. And the other aspect is that people now are going to be, people are now receiving uh, basically direct handouts. Uh, businesses are receiving handouts from the government. It's coming directly from the government. Um, some people are going to go on Centrelink for the first time in their life or the first time in, in decades. And, you know, where we don't know, but what's going to happen down the track and to try and reclaim some of this money. Are we going to go back to uh, uh, an austerity line, or are we going to, you know, be a bit more open to to, to running deficits? Because you know, it's uh, it's the way it has to be done in these in these COVID times. Just something to consider. Um, perhaps there's a role there for the social democrats. Now, I'll put up these links just on this last page for people who may be interested, because there's some things I just touched on. I didn't go too deeply on some things, but. Um, the Progressive Alliance, that's a collection of social democratic parties um, around, around the world. The Progressive Alliance, that's the social democrats in the European Parliament. There's a women's lobby and then there's the intergroup, which is important. So that's cross-party cross European Parliament. And then there's an important, um, the, um, when it comes to press and media freedom and independence, it's the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom. Um, also social media, there's, if, if you're interested in any of these topics on social media, even though um, uh, this is Poland, there are English language sites as well. And Facebook is also uh, very active. Um, people have set up fake Facebook pages as well. So I think I should finish there. I've gone up over time a bit. 
Quite a bit? Oh, not, not too bad. Not too bad. Five minutes or so. Oh, 